Hi, I'm Phil Caveney. This is kind of a momentous day for me. I have been working on several projects almost simultaneously, and this seems to be the moment where it's all sort of come together. I think maybe the first thing I'm going to talk about is a project I have and a lifetime struggle. Uh, I want to share some insights that I've recently come upon, maybe in the form of either a media presentation or a book or a memoir or something like that. But my working title for it is the With the Help of the Buddha Diet Book. Don't count calories, count karma. And what it occurs to me is that for my a, a basic tenet of Buddhism is that there is suffering in the world and that there is a kind suffering comes out of struggling and striving and continually fighting against that which cannot really be fought against. And I can say that through my life I have struggled with my weight, sometimes apparently successful, sometimes not so much. When I was 11 years old, I was a cute little 5 foot 2, 210 pound fat boy. And I was kind of dressed funny and uh, hung around with my father and read a lot of books and then I decided I didn't want to do that. I, I wanted to change. And when I was 12 in seventh grade, I went from being five feet two and 210 pounds to five nine and five, 155 pounds. And hoping maybe that would make me happy or make me people like me more. And there were some cool things about it. I mean, I can remember on my on my 13th birthday, now, well, we won't say how long ago, but it was in the 50s, in the late 50s, I went to the beach with my 18-year-old brother who had just graduated from high school, my late 18-year-old brother, and my friend Angie Libero, now retired Air Force Colonel Angie Libero, and the three of us were uh, sort of piggyback fighting with cute girls on our shoulders. And since I looked like I was a college freshman or something, rather than a cute little fat boy, that was kind of good. And I remember that there's a, there's a picture of Angela Barrow and my brother and I taken in 1957 when they graduated high school. And we sort of look like young lions. They're, t they're tall, they're, he's, my brother was 6'4", Angie was 6'7", and I was 5'9", five, five feet nine, and wearing a, a kind of a light, light, ice blue colored suit, looking like I was about to start Harvard next year. But that didn't last. And I ended up for some other unrelated, but maybe related issues. Turns out that I was dyslexic and the course requirements sort of changed in such a way that I couldn't pre perform them and things that sh other students would do easily, I couldn't do, even though some of my, my intelligence was still off the board. If I had to copy a sentence, it would take me four times as, as long, and everything would be wrong. And then, I, I sort of slipped into becoming this dangerous character. I have some po poems I'll read later about that time of my life. And somehow, I got saved by that because a wrestling coach showed up at a gym class where there were a hundred of us. Bob Reif, his name was, he's still living, he took a, took a towel with a knot in it and he said to these hundred young men, well let's see who's a wrestler here and gets the towel. And I had this towel covered with sweat and spit and blood in my fist and I said, I got it, Mr. Reif. He said, you would have been a pretty good wrestler. Too bad you're ineligible. 
I said, what do you mean? He said, you got a D average and you, you, got, you have to have a D average to wrestle. And you flunked all your subjects. And I said, well, see ya, coach. He said, ah, wait, why don't you stay around and just work with the team anyway? And in the process of working with the team, I found out that getting a D average was a certain level of work in 15 minutes more and I could be an A student. And if I was an A student, then I got to be on the honor roll. And if I was on the honor roll, then I would get an hour and a half for lunch. And then I could finish three years of high school in two years so I can graduate my, with my class and go to college. And looking back at it, that was a pretty good deal. That was not a bad achievement. But things were, go were going to continue because I even made varsity heavyweight on the wrestling team until Dave Edge, this football fullback, came out, was just bigger, faster, stronger, and a better athlete than me, and he beat me. And so I was, all, I was not varsity wrestling, but I was still doing my courses. So in order to make the wrestling team, I lost 60 pounds, 60, actually 70 pounds, to wrestle at 177 and be what they call the varsity 80 pounder the next year, 77 pounder, whatever I was. But I was a lousy wrestler because I was so weak and all I could do was barely make the team. But again, there was something about I was striving. It wasn't enough to be healthy, to be young, to be not bad looking if the picture with my grandma has anything to show about it. Uh, there she is. Uh, I'll hold it up, we'll edit it in later. Actually, my grandmother said something really sweet once. I told her I was going out for wrestling, and she said, Now, Philip, you be careful. You're a cute little fat boy, and there are big, men, mean men out there, and they will, pay, they will like to pinch you. <laughs> yeah, Grandma, yeah, there is that. But, again, I was, what, it, what comes out as I think about this, most people would have been satisfied with that, but I was striving. I was striving, and that wasn't enough. And even even when I, I wrestled in college and when I did pretty well, I was always going for something perfect. And the more I would fall away from it, the more I would hate myself. And I even even to a point where if someone rejected me. And that wasn't if the person I wanted rejected me as if they didn't have anything to say about it. But then I didn't want anybody. I would march into hell. This is getting a little uh, a little dark as I talk about it. But I think that the, 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 the exhilaration I didn't feel from the things I did and the continued suffering and striving for perfection let me is, has been something that my whole life I've had to think about and deal with and compensate with. Uh, but within the, some of the formulations of Buddhism, I found another way to think about things and to think, well, maybe, maybe instead of taking the focus constantly on myself, and that's called playing God, I really wasn't thinking about anybody else. I, w I was at a, at, a, at a universe that I was at the center of. And that meant that I would tend to objectify <laughs> those things I wanted, not, not considering what, what they were or what they wanted, or what I could contribute. And wow, um, I think I even remember at a certain point in my life, I fell in with a Roman Catholic priest who was a very bright young man and I was a delegate to Vatican II as a matter of fact and I was in a position where they thought well geez you'd be a pretty good priest you know at that point a priest was a very honorable thing to do it's so amazing that a lifetime later I got accepted into a graduate theology program a few months ago in a Jesuit university which was quite an honor but it was a Christian theology program 
and I am really interested in the number of these Buddhist formulations. The idea, the paradox that maybe in not struggling, you might achieve that which you could not achieve for, through struggle. And you wouldn't constantly find, you would avoid the, the kind of attitude where you're, you're constantly getting the thing and it's never enough. Like drinking salt water or something like that. Well, is this all there is? This all? Instead of thinking, well, hey, this is a pretty good day. At my age, I'm working on a bunch of new projects. I recently don't seem to be eating compulsively. Um, one of my friends, uh, one of my, I, I have, I'm blessed with the Association of Young People. One of my friends tried to encourage me, said, maybe if you keep up with this program, it'll add months to your life. You know, I thought, well, a month is better than nothing, and it, it's better than what I'd heard so far. Is this a good time to stop? Is that okay? Do you want to like, I mean it's still recording now but we can cut it out, but do yeah. you want to say like something like, so that's a little bit about me, like stay tuned and yeah. like subscribe yeah. to my yeah. channel yeah. for yeah. more book reviews yeah. and all yeah. that kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm going to say that that's maybe more than I should have given you about myself. I am, I am a wrestler though. I am Jacob the Wrestler and I wrestle with things and I struggle with them. And I have a number of lifetime interests, and they have to do with books, media production, my poetry, uh, a play I've written, things I want to share, and stuff. One of, one of the most exciting things for me to do is find something that fascinates me and find somebody I care about and say, have you looked at this? Have you heard about this? And that's sort of what I'm going to be doing. I'm, I hope that this is a way that I can find people to talk about stuff that I think is really, really neat. Like I, I turned on the, the, uh, my cable television late last night and it turned out that a friend of mine is doing a course on the Black Death. And it is just breathtaking. Uh, part of the function of this uh, channel will be as a, as a source of review. And in order for me to review things, people will have to send things to me. Books, videos they might have produced, something tangible so I can hold it up in my hand and talk about it. Now, the thing is with any review, we can never review everything that's sent. But it's good free publicity for you to have me review your stuff because I've been doing it for 40 years now. I've probably written written 200 academic reviews for just about everything from major newspapers to academic journals. For Phil Caveney to review one of your books, articles, stories, send to Phil Caveney at Building DO2, Mailbox 94, Suite 317 at 800 Wisconsin Street in Eau Claire, Wisconsin, 54703.